Hello and welcome to the State of Scottish Football here on the Estate of Mind Network. My name is Struan Garvey and you know this by now, but we're currently live across Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitch, everywhere. And I don't think any platforms are down tonight. We had a bit of a hiccup on Monday evening, but we seem to be okay tonight. And thankfully, if anything does go wrong, I'm not on my own today. I do have Mr. Jack Donnelly with me. Jack, how are you doing? Doing very well, thank you, mate. Happy to be here on a Wednesday night. I've, I missed out on my usual Monday slot to your good self, uh, Glenn and Dave. So happy to be back here on a Wednesday night. Uh, it is indeed Wednesday, middle of the week. You know, we're, we're halfway through the week, technically, if we if we go for a Monday to Friday. But, the well, as you can see by the title suggests, we're just going to jump straight into our first topic today, which is Ryan Porches's red card appeal was denied. Now, a lot of people questioned whether Hibs should even have appealed it because... I think a lot of people would say it was a red card, although, however, a lot of Hibs fans and other fans of Scottish football would say he got the ball and he didn't get it. But you always appeal these things anyway. Are, are you surprised that this has been knocked back because now Ryan Porteous will serve a two-match ban? Not at all, to be honest. I'm not at all surprised that it was not back. The appeal, uh, I think, from seeing the tackle, obviously, I would have I would have liked to have seen it live, but Stu and you and I were both working at the other Hibs-Rangers game that was going on at the same time as the, the men's game on Sunday afternoon, so we didn't get to see it live. But I, I don't know. I, I, I was a bit dubious over the decision to begin with, but kind of looking more clearly into it, it's absolutely a red, it's absolutely a red card. And uh, I feel like Hibs were right in that. I think every club's just going to want to back their players as much as possible when you think about it. But uh, the appeal was kind of expected, I, I suppose, from Hibs. But as equally as the appeal was expected, it was equally expected that it would have got knocked back, which hasn't worked out in Hibs' favour because rather than just serving the one game suspension, he's now serving two. So he'll miss uh, Dundee United. I think it's Dundee United anyway. It is Dundee United yeah. on this, the, the 16th and then Aberdeen the following weekend. So two games that Hibs are going to be without Ryan Portis in an area of their squad that they're already un unnecessarily light in. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. And you say that because I was just going to bring up Hibs are already struggling badly with their defence. You know, you can only really call on two centre halves and Paul Hanlon and Ryan Porteous to put in a shift throughout a season. How big of an issue is this going to be now losing Porteous? I know he does get a lot of slag for being, you know, as Stephen Gerrard, whether it was right or not, you know, has criticised the kid as well as he put it, you know, saying that he's not learning and stuff like that. But he is still one of Hibs' first choice centre backs. And for the past couple of seasons, he has been now. There's two options that Hibs have. You've got the reliable 35-year-old um, McGregor, or you've got the new up-and-coming 20-year-old Nathan Wood, who still hasn't played a game yet. And one of them is going to have to partner Paul Hanlon. Mm. What, how do Hibs cope with this situation? I mean, I, I suppose they can kind of be thankful that they've got a two-week period to make sure that the players are all fighting fit, and then it's only going to be two games in the space in the space of a week. So you've got uh, Dundee United on the Saturday, and then Aberdeen the following weekend. So they're not going to have to deal with the situation for too much longer, uh, or long at all, to be honest. I think. If I were Jack Ross, I'd probably try and bleed in Nathan Wood at this point, to be honest, because as you said, he's not actually had a kick of the ball yet for Hibs. And uh, Darren McGregor, you said it again, he's 35. He's not getting any younger. He's going to be a bit more, a bit less mobile. And when you've got potentially a more immobile centre-half in Paul Hanlon alongside Porches, who'd probably do the majority of the leg, the leg work, it's probably better off if Hibs do have someone like Wood in that position to replace him. So... I think it's probably quite good that they don't have to deal with it for too much longer and they're just going to need to hope and pray that uh, they don't suffer an injury in that time period. JD and Coke, they're just making the point that the fact Nathan Wood signed was baffling just because he hasn't played at all. And I think mm. I think that's a good point, to be honest, because Hibbs desperately needed a centre-half and it was it was quite laughable, to be honest, the way it came about. You know, Jason Kerr, Jamie McCart linked, Joseph Simonovic. You know, I don't even know if he still plays football technically these days. He was linked on a free... And then out of nowhere, it was Nathan Wood. Now, when you actually do some research on Nathan Wood and look into his background, he's, he's quite an interesting player because he's the captain of the England under-20 team. Neil Warnock's a big fan of him. He's coming from Middlesbrough on loan. He's, he's very highly thought of. And one of his biggest attributes is his pace. You know, he's uh, there was records he set sometimes, I believe, at his, at his high school and stuff like that for sprinting. So he's he's got pace about him. And I think that's exactly what Hibs need. But he doesn't seem to be getting the game time. And for a player who... I've said this a few times on this show. I only see him being at Hibs for a maximum 12 months. I don't think he is going to, A, stay any longer because it's almost a lose-lose situation. You know, either he doesn't perform and he ends up going back to Middlesbrough or he does perform really well and Middlesbrough pull him back in because there'll be a lot of teams in England who'll be looking at him, a young centre-half who's already captaining 
you know, a, a talented team as it is not getting game time or perhaps is getting game time, he's going to be popular no matter what happens there. So I think from a Hibs point of view, it's kind of a lose-lose situation from that. But at the same time, he has to be getting games, doesn't he? No, you've hit the nail on the head, Shun. I mean, this is the thing. If you're a young guy and you're looking to kind of uh, catapult your career into something in something big, I mean, captain of England under 20s, that shouldn't be understated. I mean, you know how deep the well of talent in England does run. We've seen it through the last couple of generations. They've got an absolutely fantastic squad. We hate to say it because we're probably going to see England succeed at tournaments in the near future, which from a Scotland point of view isn't the best thing in the world. But... I mean, Nathan Wood could potentially be one of these players. You can't really say it because you've not had first-hand experience of watching him because he's not had any game time at Hibs. And it's as J.D. Cope was saying, it just seems a bit baffling the fact that he's signed this young up-and-coming centre-back with a lot of hype around him and they've not opted to utilise him whatsoever. Now, <clears throat> you never really want to wish a player ill or wish a player uh, badly at all, but Nathan Wood will kind of be really, really hoping that he catches Jack Ross's eye in the next couple of weeks and can force himself into replacing Porches for these two games and potentially replacing Paul Hanlon for, for the season onwards and could potentially end up partnering Porches for the remainder of the season, especially if he has wanted to kick on and get his career up to up to scratch of where he could be at 19, 20 years old. So I know it's, it's, a, it's an odd, it was an odd signing and I mean, why, why bring in someone like that if you're just not going to play him? I mean, especially on loan, you bring in a young talent centre-back, you're not going to play him. What's the point? Why would you not just pick up somebody on free agency that's just going to sit and be a bench warmer? Why would you potentially stunt a blossoming young career from um, from get from getting off, off the ground? So, odd decision, but hopefully it starts to pay out now for the young guy. It's interesting because Wood would have seen that red card, Wood would have... Um, and probably thinking in the back of his mind, this could be his chance. And oh, I, I do understand why McGregor was brought on. You know, I think it would have perhaps been a bit harsh for Nathan Wood to be thrown in against Rangers 10 men at Ibrox. It would have been a very difficult game to to come in. Obviously, McGregor has the experience and that's the obvious choice. So I think Wood will be saying, you know, we've got a game coming up against United and then Aberdeen after that. Let me start, you know, let me show you mm. why you signed me, what I can bring to the team. And I think if he does perform well in these games, he definitely can nail down that spot because... Let, let's be honest here, the competition at the moment is not too high for Hibs. The defence is not mm. the strongest area by any stretch of the imagination. So if Nathan Wood can perform, I think he can easily get into that team. And, and that sort of brings me on to the next point, that Hibs technically te technically are in the title race at the moment, as are Hearts. And there's a January transfer window coming up. We'll, we'll, we'll start with Hibs because we're talking about them at the moment. What do Hibs need to do in January if they want to stay in this title race? Oh, uh, first and foremost, hold on to Martin Boyle. I think yeah. they need to make sure that he isn't tempted by a move away anywhere in the country or abroad. They need to make sure they have him for as long as they possibly can. I would also say the same for Kevin Nisbet. I know January last year he was subject to a bid from Birmingham City, I believe it was, and he was a bit uh, peeved off that he wasn't allowed to embark away from Easter Road. But uh, I think he's a massively important player and obviously got the goal that opened the scoring against Rangers at Ibrox on Sunday. And he's not had the best start to start to the season uh, compared to some other uh, forwards in the league, but he's a massively important player and a massively important goal scorer for Hibs. We've seen that over the last year or so. So massively, massively important once again. I think it has just got to be the defence against you. And I know you'll probably share this as a Hibs fan yourself, that you just do want to strengthen because... In various points along that back line, it's ageing. I mean, you think Paul McGinn and Paul Hanlon, they are the, the wrong side of 30, you would say, uh, at this moment in time anyway. And you're going to want to have some long-term replacements coming in. You're going to want to get another right-back. You're going to want to get another couple of centre-backs, considering the age of McGregor as well. And you'd imagine that Wood's probably on his way out after this uh, this season as well. So you're going to want to get another couple of young guys in and get them involved. Uh, I'm not too sure elsewhere. I feel like midfield... It's probably all right. I mean, you've got like McGuinness has started well. Jake Dolly Hayes has done really well since coming in. Gogic is still in there, of course. Uh, John Ewell's going to move more centrally. Yeah, I think just keeping a hold of the stars and making sure that you can potentially bolster, bolster the defence a little bit, that's probably the most important thing that Hibs could do in this January window. But where do you see it going yourself? I mean, from the Hibs point of view, you can provide that a lot better than I can. So what, what would be a successful January window for Hibs in your mind? Well, certainly one of the St Mirren midfielders, because I think that just goes without saying it's a, it's a certainty for Hibs at this point. And if the Jamie McGrath rumours were true at the end of the summer, then I wouldn't be surprised if they do move for him again. Of course, as well, Scott Allen and Dre right, were rumoured to be part of that deal, didn't go ahead. I wouldn't be surprised if they do 
maybe make another attempt to try and bring him in. You know, St. Mirren are doing well, but I think Jamie McGrath would be open to a move away. I think he's proven to be one of the best players in the Premiership on his day, and St. Mirren are not looking like they're going to get top-half football, potentially, when you think about the quality of St. Johnson, Hearts, well, actually, maybe not Aberdeen at this point, but I think he could definitely be tempted away from... From a hip's point of view, though, obviously the defence is the biggest issue. You know, you've said that there. Another defender who probably could leave very soon is Josh Doig. You know, he's young and up and coming, but he's had a lot of interest from down south. Could easily be tempted away, I believe. You know, Ryan Porteous is probably going to be a, a mainstay for Hibs, I hope, uh, for years to come. But then, as you said, McGregor's aging, Paul McGinn's aging. I don't know if Chris Cadden will become sort of into that defence if he'll take on that right back role. He's sort of been playing as a as a wing back to a winger at the moment. So I'm not sure if there'll be a, a transition there. Matt Macy is another interesting one as well, because obviously he's a two year loan from Arsenal. So whether that becomes permanent or not, I don't think Arsenal need another goalkeeper at the moment. They're pretty pretty well off in that department. So mm-hmm. hopefully Matt Macy can become permanent because for me he's been one of the Hibs best players this season. You know, I think his shot stop, and we saw it in the Edinburgh Derby, you know, I don't need to explain it any more than that. He he can mm. keep the ball at the net. Fair enough, there's been a few occasions where he maybe could have done better. But overall, I think he's been a, a really solid goalkeeper. It's, it's always going to be difficult to replace Marciano, given how just consistent he was for the past three, four years at Hibs. So there's a lot of questions in the defence. Up front, I totally agree. I think Martin Boyle has to stay. You know, one of that classic Rio Ferdinand on BT Sport, you know, put the contract down, write any number you want on it because he's invaluable to Man United, to Man United and Rio Ferdinand there. He's invaluable to Hibbs and, and what he brings to the team. The midfield as well, it's, it's solid. I, I could see another striker. You know, James Scott has come in. He's, he's not really done much at all, to be honest. I'm not sure when Christian Deutsch is going to be coming back into the team either. And obviously Kevin Nisbet can't do all the work on his own. So I... I would like another strike in that department as well. You know, I could get greedy and I could reel off a whole host of names that I'd want in. But I think if Hibs are to bring anyone in, it has to be the defence, as we've said. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if they try something like a pre-contract with Jamie McCart. St. Johnson, his contract expires in the summer. I wouldn't be surprised if Hibs try and get him in earlier or something, so to speak, like that. Because from January on, you can sign those contracts. So I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if that happens. But obviously, you know, I said at the start of it, title race. I'm not sure if Hibs will even be in the title race by the time the January transfer window opens. It could have completely fallen away by that point. But at the moment, they're technically in a title race. And the other team who are technically in a title race, as Joel Sked will happily point out, is Hearts. Hearts have been fantastic this season, to be honest. The only team in the Premiership who are still um, undefeated. And, and before I ask you, you know, what do they need to do? Just just how impressed have you been with Hearts so far? Of course, you were at the game at the mm. weekend against Motherwell. I was. That's the first time I've actually had to see this Hearts team in the flesh. Of course, I never saw them at all. I did see them, actually. Uh, last season, I saw them when they came down to Somerset Park uh, in February, I think it was, for a 1-0 win. Uh, I was lucky enough to be in the press box for that game. And I really wasn't massively massively enamoured by the team. I mean, we all know that it's a completely different team this season compared to last. But it's a bit funny to see the last two times I've seen Hearts, I've seen Liam Boyce open the score with a penalty. And that's exactly what happened on Saturday, of course. They went on to win 2-0, and a nice Stephen Kingsley free kick from the edge of the box sealed it up. But no, massively, massively improved team compared to last season where they were in the championship, which you could probably expect for a team like Hearts. They wanted to come up. They wanted to reaffirm their place in the top division for as long as they possibly could and as quickly as they possibly could. They've done that, and I think anyone that's read any of what our good friend Jamie McIntosh has put out over the last few weeks or so will know that it's all down to Hearts recruitment over over the last uh, last few months or so, and that's directly down to Robbie Nielsen and Joe Savage. Uh, it's been absolutely fantastic. Players like, uh, they're, they're JD in quote, they're Hearts have surprised most people how well they've done. I, I would probably agree with that. As I think they've, we, we kind of knew they were going to come up swinging, but I think no one expected them to be sitting eight games in and unbeaten. And the, uh, are some great players in the squad, absolutely. I mean, you think Benny Beningame coming in from Everton, no one really had much of an idea of who that guy was up until he started playing for it. And then you saw him hit the league like a duck to water. He's been absolutely fantastic. The same can be said for Cami Devlin. I know it's a smaller sample size for him having only played the two games, but a lot of people are really, really happy with the midfield partnership that the pair of them have struck up. And of course, you still get some brilliant players in there from last season. I mean, Michael Smith, I thought was excellent against Motherwell. Liam Boyce, of course, opened the scoring and is, I think, joint top scorer with Boyle. I think I could be right in saying that. I could be wrong. Some yeah, of they're both on six, I think, at the moment. Uh, six, and then that was his yeah, tenth in all competitions. So, uh, he's been doing very well. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I think 
they've definitely impressed impre- impressed me and impressed plenty of others in this uh, in this world of Scottish football. Definitely. Yeah, I'd just like to point out, sorry, that Kenny Whitson says that Matt Macy is a permanent transfer. Sorry, I, I thought it was a two-year loan. That's my bad. But um, no, some people have actually been pointing out about Hearts is their squad depth is brilliant. And, and it is really, really strong, to be honest, for a team who have just come up from the championship. You know, I know a lot of people said last season that they were a premiership team in the championship, but to still come up and have the window that they've had, it's, it's a really good squad. You know, is, that, is there an area that you think they still need to improve in? Because just looking at it on paper, they've got one of the best keepers in the Premiership, if not the best, and Craig Gordon, of course, he's the captain, and he's Scotland's number one. In that defence, you've seen the likes of Stephen Kingsley playing really well, Cammy Smith, John Souter, who has been fantastic, to be honest, staying fit. Obviously, the midfield pivot, who we mentioned as well, are Cammy Devlin and Benny Benningham have just been unbelievable so far. And then up front, you know, Mackay Smith, Mackay Stephen, pardon me, Barry Mackay, and then obviously Liam Boyce is banging them in with absolutely no issues. And Ben Woodburn, another one who came in on loan from Liverpool, it's, it's quite hard to identify where Hearts necessarily need to sign anybody at the moment it can be but it's still possible i think uh, i was thinking about this question when i was walking back up from university earlier today Stuart, and when we were going over the running order and i think if there was one uh player i would want to bring into hearts it would probably be another striker because mm. out of everyone else in the squad there's no out and out goal scorer in that entire squad other than uh other than Liam Boyce. I mean, you know, the likes of Woodburn, Mackay, and Mackay Stephen will potentially chip in with a few goals here and there, but their main source of goals is Boyce. And if something were to happen to him, hopefully it doesn't, but if he, if he does go down injured at some point, I don't think Armin Nandule is a replacement of the same calibre. I think he, he's he's an interesting player, especially in this level. I mean, he can cope with the championship fairly well. I mean, he was quite uh, brutish and bullish up front. And he gave a lot of championship defenders a lot of trouble. Of course, standing six foot six tall, he's always going to do that. But Premiership, it's league above. I mean, quite literally the league above. So I, I don't know if he'd be able to be the same source of goals that Liam Boyce provides at the moment. So I think potentially looking to bring in a backup, uh, a more a more uh, suitable pack backup to Liam Boyce would be massively uh, beneficial for Hearts anyway. Luke's just made a good point in the comments there saying, oh, that's the wrong... Um, apologies. Look, uh, the Rangers game has potential to be a real banana skin for Hearts. You know, the scoreline will show it might be fair for the rest of the season and a heavy loss could set them back. And obviously, you know, Rangers are the top team in Scotland at the moment, obviously, but mm-hmm. Hearts are still undefeated. We saw Hibs. I thought Hibs gave Rangers a really good game. And I think you could argue that had Port just not been sent off, Hibs could easily get a point from that game, if not all three of them. And I think some people would say that Hearts are a better tight than Hibs at the moment. If Hearts can go... Can they get something from that game? You know, if they were to get points from Rangers, that would be a massive confidence boost. They've already mm-hmm. held Hibs and Aberdeen this season, and they beat Celtic on the opening day. You know, if they beat Rangers as well or get anything from that game, that's a massive point to say. You know, we're undefeated so far. We can we can push for the title or at least be there or thereabouts. You know, a lot of people were doubting yeah. whether Hearts would be top half of the table, and now the question is: Are they going to be compete for European places? Three or four months time, we might be saying: Are they going to compete for the title? Yeah, it's an odd, odd thing to say. I mean, I had them predicted seventh, I think, uh, just by St Mirren and egg on my face already within eight games of this season. I mean, it's expect it's expected, but no less uh, no less demoralising for myself and my own predictions. Uh, I think it definitely could be a little bit of a banana skin, but I suppose there's one thing that Hearts are going to have that no other team in Scotland has had uh, in the league this season anyway, and I know we're going to get onto this a little bit later on, but there's been a, a an away allocation awarded to Hearts. Uh, of course, the red zones have been scrapped or are being scrapped, we should say, and away fans are going to be able to get themselves back into Ibrox and Celtic Park. So they're going to be able to have, I, I think, just under a thousand travelling jambos. I think it was to, yeah, a thousand under. I uh, just down down, to, down the road to Ibrox, so they'll be making a fair noise in there, uh, as we as we know they can do. So interested to see if that plays a factor at all. I mean, there's been a lot of uh, here saying discussing about Rangers in front of fans this season, but I don't tend to read massively into that. I think a team perform a team would always kind of perform better if they're uh, if they've got their own fans backing them. But people can obviously have their own opinions, and I wouldn't I wouldn't necessarily say mine's the right one, of course. But uh, yeah, I think it, while it could still be a banana skin, I would I would agree that Hearts have probably been a better side than Rangers this season. I know it's a fairly bold claim to make, but when you see the Rangers side that get put out last season, it's really really 
it's it's been a regression to be honest and uh, I know they're still sitting top you can't really take that away from them but it's a lot tighter and they're not sitting as top as comfortably as they would have wanted to especially coming in off the back of an unbeaten season so yeah I'm, I'm really looking forward to that game when it does happen after the international break and uh yeah just interested to see how it all pans out definitely of course it's, it's the premiership champions and rangers versus a team who were promoted from the, the championship you know mm. uh, the, you'd think realistically the champions of the premiership should be able to beat them but I think it could be a really good game. I think it could potentially be the best game of the season so far, just in terms of the stakes, what it means, how it could shape the rest of the season. Because if Rangers do drop more points and say Celtic pick up them, Celtic could be right back there in the in the title race, vice versa as well. If Hearts get beaten, it could be them suddenly falling away and they might be totally out of the equation, might have a, a real sticky patch. It's, there's a lot to play for in that game and I'm really excited about it, to be honest, from a, a neutral point of view. But... Mm. Of course, as you say, that's after the international break because there's internationals coming up. It's a it's a pretty good time for internationals. And, and one player who a lot of people wanted in the first team was Calvin Ramsey. Obviously, he's burst onto the scene for Aberdeen. We've been crying out for a right back, to be perfectly honest. We just we just seem to only produce left backs. But now we, we seem to have quite a few right backs coming through. And interestingly enough, Calvin Ramsey has now attracted the interest from down south. I th- namely, I think Manchester United have been one of the team's around him just how, how impressive do you think Calvin Ramsey has been this season because we're only a few games in and a massive team like Man United are interested in signing one of Aberdeen's mm. players just a team yeah it's, it's it is a little bit strange when you think about it just considering we're only eight games into the league season and you're already getting a, an 18 year old linked away to one of the biggest clubs in world football uh, off the back of really less than 10 performances yeah. yeah I mean I don't know did, I mean did you know anything about Calvin Ramsey before this season started not a thing. I'd maybe seen his name popped up at some point, maybe on the bench for Aberdeen. Maybe, you know, whenever you have these debates about who has the best youngsters coming through at their teams and they argue the academy has maybe been thrown in the mix. But coming through, I didn't know anything about him, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, that, I think that's I wanted to be Scotland's first right back. <laughs> first, well, that's another, that's another debate. Well, one, that's one, one, of, the, debate. one of the right backs. That's, uh, uh, that's another yeah, debate. no, that. I, I, I think that's what makes it even more impressive, Stuart, is the fact that he really came into this season a relative unknown and has just propelled himself into stardom from less than 10 league games and a couple of performances in Europe as Aberdeen kind of crumbled out of those competitions. Uh, I think he's deserving of the, the Scotland nods. I mean, I'm go- I'm heading to Tynecastle tomorrow night for the under-21s match and I'm a bit gutted that I'm not going to be able to see him play in the flesh, of course. Both he and Aaron Hickey pulled out due to injuries from the under-21 squad. And uh, I think he's been the one bright spark of Aberdeen's otherwise dour season because there's really not been a lot to be happy about or celebrate from an an Aberdeen point of view this season. I mean, we've had it on here for numerous shows already with the Stephen Glass puns have just been rolling in these live comments. And you and I have had to stop ourselves from just bursting out laughing every time. But he really is under a lot, a lot of pressure. And Glass and Glass uh, Ramsey, sorry, is the one guy that's really potentially stopping him from already being out the door. He's potentially stopping the glass from shattering, to be honest. But if if say a bid was to come in for our <clears throat> Calvin Ramsey, apologies there. It's it's hard to nail down an exact price tag because as we've said, he's only played a handful of games so far this season. He's still only eighteen, you know. Mm-hmm. You think about like Kieran Tierney went for twenty five million. He's not he's not near that ability to be perfectly honest. But for a team like United, I mean, they like to splash the cash in the window. Say, I'll say five million because I believe the same figure of five million was thrown into the equation for Nathan Patterson to go down south. Do you think that's a number that Aberdeen could potentially be interested in? Because they've currently got one of the best young players in Scotland on their hands right now. But that kind of money could be massive for Aberdeen. It could for a be. player who's it's only played a handful of games. Yeah, no, you're right, especially depending on what they end up having to do in terms of the Stephen Glass situation, whether they need to be able to provide the compensation, depending on whether they get rid or not, um, whether they're going to have to use that money elsewhere to kind of fill glaring gaps and weaknesses across the rest of their squad. It's tough. I, I don't I don't really want to kind of try and narrow down the current market value or, or like the price that someone like Calvin Ramsey would be going for because... As you say, it's been only a handful of games. This is kind of his first proper season, I suppose, his first proper go at it, other than kind of being included in a couple of Aberdeen squads in the past. So 
it's tough to see kind of how much Aberdeen would potentially be looking for for him. I mean, you're absolutely right in saying he's never going to be going for a Kieran Tierney price at this moment in time. Of course he's not. I'd be absolutely ludicrous to suggest otherwise. But I don't know. I, d- I don't know whether he stays the whole season, whether we get another season out of him in Scotland before he moves abroad, because I think you want to see at least a full season under his belt before anyone starts jumping the gun and potentially making a move for him. So, interested to see what happens, but I'm just going to be really interested to see how he develops across the rest of the year, the rest of the season. Well, according to Transfer Market, his current market value is 180000 So, you know, I'm I'm thinking potentially up in the millions. Uh, Brand Warriors come in there saying Celtic should offer Ralston <laughs> plus cash in January. I'd love that offer to be made to be perfectly honest. Just, I'd, I'd, just to see how Aberdeen react to that one. But yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, I, I don't think his value should be that low. At the same time, though, I am I'm loath to really big him up too much. After all, we've only seen him play for a handful of appearances, mm-hmm. to be honest. And a few people actually blamed him for the defending against Celtic at the weekend. So. It's hard to nail down, but another right back who who has emerged is Nathan Patterson, and he sort of burst onto the scene last season. And what I thought was very significant was he started ahead of James Tavernier at the weekend against Hibs. That was Rangers' biggest game of the season since the old firm, to be honest, given all things considered. And they dropped not only one of their best players, but also their captain. You know, how how big of a compliment is that to Nathan Patterson, the fact that Stephen Gerrard had faith in him that he would drop his own captain to play this teenager in such an important game. A must-win game. I mean, you saw Gerrard's reaction at the end of it. That meant a lot to him. He was benching players in the Europa League game as well prior mm. to it. I think it's a massive statement and it's a massive confidence booster for anyone who is invested in Nathan Patterson from a club or a country standpoint. I mean, I very much like to see him starting for Scotland at the weekend against Israel because I think he's a fantastic mm-hmm. player. But a lot of people had grievances with the amount of game time that he actually had at Rangers. And I think the fact that Gerard's now turning to him in these big occasions over his club captain, who, let's face it, has been pretty poor by his own standards this season. I mean, it's really not been the best uh, campaign for James Tavernier so far. So I think the fact that he is turning to uh, Patterson now in these instances speaks volumes about how much uh, respect he has for the player. And I think it's about time that he's kind of starting to see the rewards of his efforts kind of come to the forefront now. I think he's a player that does deserve to be playing week in, week out, whether that's for Rangers or whether that's for another team. I think I am thinking selfishly, to be honest, from the Scotland point of view. I mean, we've got these good right backs coming through at the moment. You've got the likes of uh, Pass and Ramsey. Aaron Hickey can play right sided as well when you've got an overabundance of left backs at the moment. And even when you do, you still get the likes of Doig coming through. So you're not going to want to overload that position all too much. But it's massive because when you're a young player and you're talented, you deserve to play games. Like that, that should be the long and the short of it. And I think if if Patterson, sorry, I keep getting the two mixed up, is going to be a prolonged fixture in that Rangers team, then I'm going to be very happy about it because I think he is a very, very good player with a bright, bright future. And I want to see that realised as soon as possible. It was interesting because the two teams who he was linked with were the two Liverpool teams, of course, Everton and Liverpool themselves. And I didn't understand the Liverpool comparisons or need for him at all. I mean, I think Patterson's a great player, but Liverpool already have the best right back mm. in world football, arguably, at the moment. So I don't see why they'd want another one. But I, th- I think Everton was interesting because Seamus Coleman's a pretty good footballer at the end of the day. Carlo Ancelotti said he's the best captain he's ever had, which is baffling to me, to be perfectly honest, given the the calibre that Ancelotti has managed. But, you know, Coleman's getting on as, in, his, in, his own, in his own age, really, in his own career. Do you think a move to Everton would appeal to Nathan Patterson? Obviously, he's come through with Rangers. It's great. He's for that Scotland team. But we, we look at the likes of Kieran Tierney making that step to Arsenal. It's a massive move to go down south, big money transfers. Do you think that could be something that Nathan Patterson will look to do in the future? Or do you think he is going to be a, a Rangers right back locked in for a few years? Because I think if you'd asked this question a couple of months ago, if Everton were looking at him and he's still second choice behind James Tavernier, he's going to want to move no matter what. But if there's mm. that possibility now that he can be the first choice right back ahead of James Tavenier, I think there would be a massive appeal for him to stay at Rangers. It's tough. It's, t- it's tough to defeat. I've put you on the spot there a little bit. You, you have a little bit. I can't lie, mate. Um, obviously, I do not know what Nathan Patterson is thinking or, or what, what, he, what, what his uh, idea of it, his future prospects are. But I think you can absolutely take encouragement from those players who have gone down to England and been successful already. You think Kieran Tierney, you think Virgil van Dijk, you think, to an extent, Stuart Armstrong, untested John, John Waters. McGinn. John McGinn, there you go. <laughs> uh, you think, I mean, even more recent 
or uh, literally uh, the last couple of months, Ryan Christie seems to have gone down and hit the hit the league running in the championship with Bournemouth. So I think when you have the opportunity to potentially go to Everton, maybe have a season working behind Seamus Coleman before you usurp him and take his first team spot. And by that, you're going to be, what, 20, 21? And you're starting for a very well-established Premier League club in Everton. I think that's going to be an absolutely massive, uh, massively attractive prospect. Now, I don't think he's going to move anytime soon. I would imagine that if he, if he does move at all in the near future, it's going to be next summer, if not the summer after, because it all just does depend now on how much game time he gets between now and the end of the season. Because if this is going to be a regular occurrence that we see him starting over to Vernier, I think his stock's just going to rise and people are going to want to make a move on him a lot sooner rather than later. But if he does still play the understudy role for another season or so, he could potentially be looking to get out on a bit of a cut price deal. But as I say, I'm not Nathan Patterson, so I can't speak for exactly what he's viewing his own career as at the moment. Definitely. It's definitely one to keep an eye on, to be honest. One of the best players, well, best young players in Scotland coming through. I'd like him to stay here a bit longer. I think it'd be better for him to develop his career, especially now that he has broken into the Scotland team. And there's quite a debate up amongst the Scotland team in the defence because there's many players who we see there who we just, you just throw question marks in your mind. You think, why on earth is, is that man still in the team? But one defender who I didn't think I'd ever be considering for the national side again is Charlie Mulgrew. And yet, He's come out saying he's determined to get back into the national team. Now, I, I don't have anything against Charlie Mulgrew. You know, I, I like the fact that he was our penalty taker in the national team a few years ago. You know, he would take a set piece and he wasn't too bad at the end of the day. I remember him and Christoph Bera at the back. We've come a long way since then thinking about it. But, you know, I, I don't have the fondest of memories. But at the same time, I've, I've got nothing against him. But do you think Charlie Mulgrew, there's a, there's a future where he actually gets back into the, the national team because to play devil's advocate, you know, I've just slagged him off there, but he's been pretty good for Dundee United since coming back, to be honest, uh, back up to Scotland, that is. They've kept a lot of clean sheets. He's looked solid. He's a leader. As I mentioned, he has a set-piece threat. Even if he doesn't necessarily start for the national team, he's possibly a better player to have in and around that dressing room. Somebody who's won a lot of titles in his career, somebody who's uh, been there, done that sort of character. And possibly you look at someone like Scott McKenna, would it be more valuable for the squad to have, say, a Charlie Mulgrew rather than Scott McKenna? I mean, neither of them are going to start, but would you rather have an experienced head in there? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you've got Brown Warrior coming in there saying Mulgrew can rake a diagonal ball 60 yards to feet. And I think that is something that Steve Clark wants to have in his battling. He wants to have defenders who are comfortable with the ball and can make those passes. I mean, you can imagine Mulgrew potentially on the right centre-back uh, role pinging an absolute world day up the field towards Lyndon Dykes. He taps it across for Che Adams and then it's a goal. Or vice versa, you never know. Uh, you've got the quick hit. There you go. I mean, he's even building on it there. Uh, and then Stranger of the Doctor saying not McKenna. He would rather Mulgrew. Like, there, there seems to be a bit of an opening for another centre-back to make his way into this fairly established Scotland setup. And considering we've seen Mulgrew involved in Scotland camps in the last kind of five years or so, you could potentially see an avenue for him to get back involved, and I certainly wouldn't be too annoyed about it. One thing I will say, though, is that while I do believe Mulgrew could potentially have a route back in, and if it's his mission to do so, I'm sure he's going to go about it every way uh, every way possible to make sure he does end up back in the blue of Scotland. I think there probably is one player that's a bit more deserving this season. Well, you can argue because he's not played as much because of his, in his injuries. You've got John Sutter sitting at heart, who's been absolutely fantastic since coming back from injury. Of course, he wasn't playing at the weekend. He suffered a bit of a knock. And Robin Nielsen already said when I did the post-match press that he's going to be fine. He'll be back for uh, the Rangers game in a couple of weeks. So... I think there are a couple of players, you've got Suter, you've got Mulgrew, that are probably more deserving of getting in ahead of some like Scott McKenna, who I've just not really got much time for in a Scotland shirt. I think people would probably argue the same. I think the comments are already reflecting that, and I'd imagine you and I are in a fairly uh, similar state of mind, Struan. There you go. Uh, oh, <laughs> nailed it. So, yeah, I, th I think there's definitely a route for, uh, for Mulgrew to get back in, but I think he'll probably have to fight off a lot of com off a couple of competitors to make sure he gets himself back into a squad. Yeah, definitely. And I think you need to take into consideration as well that John Suter is 10 years um, the the younger. Well, Charlie Mulgrew, Mulgrew's turned 35 recently. You know, I don't know if a player like that is is going to be wanted by Steve Clark. His, his first Scotland cap, I think, was all the way back in 2012 for Charlie Mulgrew as well. So he, ha he has been around for a while. I think it's 
44, I believe I looked at it earlier on. I, I hope that is correct. 44 caps, not bad at all. Brad Morris just made another good point there about Mulgrew that in a back three, that left centre-back spot could be ideal. Of course, he has played as a left back and as a centre-back. We do like to play that system. But I think the issue there is that sort of, that's Kieran Tierney's role, isn't it, under Steve Clark? That's got to be where I think Kieran Tierney would play. Unless, of course, there's an injury there. Charlie Mulgrew is not a bad option to have. It's It's definitely interesting because... I didn't think I'd ever be open to the prospect of Charlie Mulgrew, but there are a lot of positives that he brings. I mean, as we've seen in the comments, they're talking about his passing. He's potentially better than McKenna, but I think you've hit the nail on the head that we're talking about Charlie Mulgrew getting into the team. I think the name that should be discussed far more is John Sewer. I mean, I remember a few years ago when he broke through at Hearts and he was tipped to be the best centre-back Scotland had at the time, you know, even at a young age. He's had two really bad injuries to both of his knees. You know, it's he can't catch a break, so to speak. But now he's in good form. Hearts are in good form. It's, is this the perfect time, not necessarily this squad, but in the coming years, in the coming six to nine months, is this the perfect time for John Sutter to, to get into that team? Especially when, just just to just to slag Scott McKenna off a little bit more, I guess, not going on Forest are doing pretty poorly as well down in the English Championship. No, I think... Depending on how the next two games go, because I think if we get the win against Israel, we win against the Faroe Islands, we're in a lot more of a comfortable position in terms of the group mm-hmm. and potentially getting second and going through the playoffs for the World Cup. I think John Sutter, depending on how hearts go after this international break, could be in for that Denmark game in our next international break. I think he could be in for that squad. And I would like to see it happen ahead of someone like Scott McKenna, who, I mean, I've just bashed him a little bit and so have you. So, uh, no, I definitely see there could be an opportunity for him to get himself into a Scotland squad because, as I said, Nielsen's already said that he's going to be back for Rangers, so he'll be able to kind of get the, that run of games back under his belt. And he's been operating really well in a back three. Uh, the Hearts have been playing that flat three across with uh, the two wing backs in Smith and, and Smith and Cochrane, sorry, not Kingsley Cochrane. And he was playing on the right of that three where uh, Taylor Moore has kind of filled in in the last few weeks or so. So. Yeah, I, I would definitely think that now could potentially be their best opportunity for him. I mean, look, he's turned 25 recently. So, I mean, these are what you would describe as his prime years. So you kind of really want to get him in and bleed him into the team now if you are going to want to use him at all. And I mean, there's going to be competition for places. I'm not saying for a second he would automatically start ahead of someone like Grant Hanley or Jack Hendry, who have been more established in the Scotland setup already. But he'd be a brilliant option to take, to be honest. Definitely. I think he's definitely a player who, in my eyes, should be in the in the squad. I think he could have made it into the last one, but you never know. It could be could be his time next time. You know, we were we were arguing and complaining for months about Billy Gilmore and Nathan Patterson to get in. They finally got their shot. John Suter could turn into our next one of those players. But I think another player who has been has been cries for him to get into the national team for years, even when he was breaking through at Dundee United as a teenager, was Ryan Gold. But he, he's never making it anywhere near the team. One player, though, who has made it into the team in that similar position is Stuart Armstrong, who, by his own admission, was surprised to even be into the team. What What do you make of those comments? I don't think they're unwarranted, to be honest, because I think anyone that's watched uh, English football in Southampton specifically know that Armstrong has not really had any sort of influence on Southampton whatsoever, and the Saints have been fairly poor this Premier League season already, and... Armstrong's not really had much of a look in as a result. Uh, he does have that going for him over Ryan Gold, uh, Brown Water. He's got the hair. Right. I mean, he, do, he does have the hair. And uh, I mean, Stuart and I know all too much about having fantastic haircuts, as I'm sure everyone can tell. So tell we, we can we can re- relate to uh, Mr. Armstrong in that aspect anyway. I don't have a chat but, about mine yet, though. It's a bit disappointing. Do you not? Mm, I, oh, well, no, I don't have anything. It's gotten, it's even when I went bald over lockdown, nothing. <laughs> Well, there you go. Uh, the State of Scottish Football commenters, you need to come up with a chant for Struan Garvey's hair. That is that is your mission for the next week or so, uh, if someone wants to take time out of their busy schedule mission, to do that. you choose to accept it. <laughs> oh, very timely, very good. Uh, no, I think there is um, no, there, there's reason behind those comments, and I'd imagine it's fair enough. I think Clark's kind of going for that element of consistency. Again, as I, I always say when we talk about Clark and his squad selection, he does like having those familiar batches of players available to him. And I think ahead of such a crucial game against Israel this uh, coming Saturday, we need to win the game. And I think trying to upset the apple cart too much and change, th- change things isn't going to be much of a help to that. So 
Stuart Armstrong getting in, I would have potentially liked to see someone like Gold in ahead of him in a different squad. But for this one, I can absolutely understand why Clark's st- stuck with the players that he knows best. And that's the reason that Armstrong's in. He's not going to start against Israel. He may get some game time against the Pharaohs. But yeah, I, I suppose just recency and familiarity is what's got Armstrong into this squad. I think one thing for me with Stuart Armstrong is I like him as a player. I think he does really well. You know, I thought he was excellent at Celtic. I think under Hassan Hassan Hootl in that sort of four triple two, I think he does really well for Southampton. But I think he is a square peg in a round hole in that Scotland team because I just don't think <clears throat> there is a role for him. I mean, we we talk a lot about how we've been able to fit two left backs into the team, and I think we've done that effectively. But I just don't see a way how Stuart Armstrong fits into that team. You know, in the first game of the Euros against them, um, the Czech Republic, he was in that midfield three, and, and I thought he was awful. To be honest, I just don't think he played that role well and that's nothing against him because that's not his game you know we shouldn't have to be shoehorned into that midfield role that we've seen John McGinn play so effectively and I think as well he's not really going to do that much of a job in a front two you know I think when you look at the options that we've got there Christie can probably do it better than him Ryan Fraser obviously Adams and Dykes and this but I just don't think that would be a role for Stuart Armstrong And, and for that reason I think he's a good player I think he's one of our most talented players I think he's playing at a high level down south but I, I just don't see a way how he fits into the Scotland team. And as you said, by his own admission, he, he's quite surprised he's even made it in the first place. Yeah, I mean, it, you just do look at those players around him. I mean, your Christy, McGinn, Turnbull, there are players that are just going to be able to do his job so much more effectively than he's done. And it's a, it's a bit of a shame because I, I don't really mind Stuart Armstrong. I mean, the less said about June 2017, the better against England. But uh <laughs> just take the earphones out so you don't have to relive that memory. Uh, I, th- I think he's a, he's a good squad player, but I think you do potentially need to cut your losses to be able to advance and potentially bring in someone who's going to be more of an attack and influence, more of a goal threat, and someone like God's going to be able to do that. But I don't know. It d- depends. On, you, you never know. He could start against Israel and bag a hat trick. You just never know with football. That's the beauty of it. It's that unpredictable. So... Whether this is the last we see of Astrid Armstrong in a Scotland shot, we don't yet know. But we'll, ju- we'll just need to wait and see, I suppose. I suppose you could argue that he's got that wand of a left foot. You know, if we do get a set piece or something like that, he could be there. But then I suppose I'm also bringing Charlie Mulgrew into the argument if we're talking about a set sure, piece on a yeah. left foot. So I, I don't know if that's Stuart Armstrong's game. But yeah, I, I think it is definitely an interesting one. And whether he is in future squads, you know, I've got so many young players breaking through. As we've spoken about, well, Ryan Gold is somebody who many Scotland fans want to see get into that team. David Turnbull was another one, and he now is part of the main setup, thankfully, because, again, he's a really talented player. And I think I think Turnbull's another name who I would have over Stuart Armstrong, you know, just looking at our midfield options. I think off the bat, you've got Gilmore, McTominay, McGregor, McGinn, just mentioned there, David Turnbull, Lewis Ferguson's another one who's come into the mm-hmm. team. Ryan Christie, if he plays a bit deeper like that, you know, as, as good as Stuart Armstrong is, I think I'd argue that all of those players are better suited to that role. And, and I hope there is a way for Stuart Armstrong to be there, but I, I think you have hit the nail on the head there by saying a squad role or a, a, an impact off the bench is probably the best way that he can affect his team because he's he's just not going to cut the mustard, I, I don't think, anyway, for a Scotland national, national team anymore. But I'd hope I'd, I'd be happily proven wrong if he comes on against Israel, scores a winner, some kind of chest bikey inside the box, something like that, proves everybody wrong, runs to the touchline, you know, atonement for the the England game or something like that. God, we love a storyline in football, don't we? It would would just be a little bit poetic. But, um, yeah, it is what it is. Have you got any other final points you want to make on the Scotland team before we move on? Any players who you think are are fortunate to be there? Hmm. Interesting. Uh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. The squad isn't massively fresh in my mind. Uh, I suppose the one final comment I'd have about Scotland, just please win. Please win. Just please win. <laughs> that we, we've not beaten Israel in 90 minutes in our last four attempts. We need to. We need to make it one in five at least, please. If we're going to do it at any point, it needs to be this Saturday. I sold out Hamden. Imagine getting such a big win against Israel in front of a sold out Hamden. Just think of the atmosphere that will create. Just hands together, just please, please give us a win this weekend, lads. Do you know who scored a penalty against Israel in the past? Charlie Mulgrew. Uh, <laughs> before we move on there, Brian Warriors making another good point that you need a defensive midfielder alongside McGregor and McGinn. And I think that's possibly where Billy Gilmore comes in. And again, Tomney, yeah. I just I just don't think Stuart 
chunk of it in there, but we'll we'll move on and we'll come back to back to the home country because there was a, a very interesting statement that's come out from Dunfermline. Now Peter Grant and Dunfermline, a lot of people, including myself, had them to be promoted to the premiership. I thought they were that's looking great. like one of the best teams. Yep. I, th- I think a lot of people to be honest. I, I don't think we're alone in that one, fortunately. As well as Killy, another good team there. I think a lot of people had pars to be there thereabouts, but it's it's just not gone right at all. And a lot of weird things have happened this season with Dunfermline. You know, Graham Dorans, you were there at the game against Air United, you know, shouting back at the fans. This was supposed to be the the experienced player brought in. It, it just hasn't worked out at all. Peter Grant, though, is has still got the full backing of the board, regardless of what the fans make. How, how did you take that statement? Because a lot of neutrals I've seen on Twitter are laughing about it and thinking it's ridiculous. I, I can only imagine how the Dunfermline fans are, are reacting. But as a neutral yourself, what did you make of it? Uh, just kind of that says it all. Back in the, <laughs> yeah, it just kind of spat back in the face of the Dunfermline fans, to be honest, because, I mean, we, I mean, I'm tra- I'm just trying to scan through this statement just now and just see what it was. But I mean, it's had oh, it actually says the amount of views that the statement's had at the bottom. There's been th- almost thirty seven thousand people have read that statement, <laughs> and and thirty six thousand nine hundred ninety nine disagree with it. Yeah, I, I don't think I don't, I don't think there's going to be a lot of uh, positivity coming out. It just was a bit poor from, from a logistical point of view. It's just kind of created even more of a divide between club and fan base at this point. I mean, it's all well and good saying we hear your concerns, but we're not going to do anything about it that we think he's the right man. So despite what you have to say, it doesn't matter. We're just going to carry on the way we're going. Yeah, we, and if they do care, carry on the way they're going, they're go- they carry on the way they're going, they're going down. Plain and simple. I mean, they've not won yet. So if th- things ridiculous. don't change, they end up in the and they end up in League One, end up with Falkirk for another three seasons or something like that. Who knows? Uh no, I, I it's never gonna get that bad. I mean, you would you would absolutely think they're gonna get out of it eventually. They're too good a team or they've got too good a squad of players to get anywhere near that bottom that bottom fight. But uh things need to change and they need to change very, very quickly. I mean, I was at the three one game where Air beat them three one. And this was coming off the back of the fact that we just sacked our manager and David Hopkin. And I think if Pars were wanting a win, that was the absolute perfect opportunity for them to get one. To come to We Air, who are already a bit down and potentially out already, they've just lost our manager and they get absolutely walked all over. I mean, it took us, what, two, three minutes to open the scoring? Uh, and then get two more uh, as, as the game went on. Massive, massive red flags in that game that Dunfermline weren't able to get anything out of it and it's you only gotten worse from there and I think the relationship between the board and the fans is toxic at this moment in time and the, that statement has not helped to make re- uh, reparations whatsoever. No, nah, not at all. I, I'm quite stunned as well. I mean, it's the 6th of October and as you said, Dunfermline still haven't won a game in the Championship yet. That's ridiculous, you know. Even in the in the League Cup, they were absolutely hammered by Rangers. To be honest, it's just not been right at all. But I suppose the argument that Dunfermline will certainly be playing is you should give a manager more time. You know, if you give mm. him more time, if you've backed him, if he is the right man, you know, he can bring success. And speaking of that, Peter McAnally is coming up ten years as the Peter head mm. manager. He's the longest serving manager in Scotland. Do you think that? Perhaps football teams now are just too quick to pull the trigger and, and sack a manager, whereas it can be more beneficial to give them more time. I mean, you've seen it from any other point of view this season. Obviously, it wasn't working under Hopkin. In comes Duffy, and, and things look a lot better. Yeah, no, that it just really does depend, I suppose. It depends on what can happen, because it's always going to be a risk depending on where your stance is. I mean, you think Crystal Palace, however many seasons ago, Frank De Boer lasted four games before getting the plug, <laughs> which so. was ridiculous. Watford have just sat their manager as well uh, after 10 months, which, I mean... It's quite long for, for Watford. That's like three yeah, years considering... for Watford, to be and, honest. And we've seen, some, we've seen some moves in Scotland already. Brian Rice is away, David Hopkins away. But when you get McAnally, who's 10 years, that doesn't happen anymore in modern football. There's not a manager who's going to stay at a club longer than kind of five six years at this point i mean it just is the way modern football's played i mean these modern boards they just want as much success as quickly as they can get it and they're a lot more comfortable in taking the tough decisions of being able to say to a manager you're not working out 
you're away. So I feel like it's just the way the modern game has gone. But it's a stance that Dunfermline have taken that they fully back Peter Grant. And uh, I think the, the bit in the statement that stood out to me just glancing over it was uh, the sporting director, Thomas Megal, said that at the beginning of the season, we saw entertaining and successful football. Unfortunately, we couldn't take the style and results into the championship. Arguably, that's what you want. So the we were good. Football. That's, I mean, in the Premier Sports Cup group stages, they were they were absolutely electric. But then, when it comes to league season, they're <laughs> dug meat. It's, it's, I mean, it's just a bit of a redundant comment to make, Stu. And I don't know, like, it just seems so weird to have that stance that for four games we were brilliant, and then we came into the league and we went away to Rangers in the cup draw, and it's just not replicated whatsoever. It's been, it's been poor. It's been really, really poor as has that attitude been from the Dunfermline board. And I think the fans that I've seen on social media are rightly up in arms about it. It's quite funny, isn't it? We were we were good effectively in the friendlies when the games didn't matter, but but now they do matter and we're not playing it any well. And, and, I, and I guess that's the argument. You know, if you play good, attractive football, but you're not getting the results, it, it won't keep fans happy. And, you know, I know a lot of people say that they want to see exciting football at their club, but quite often... A board will be happy if you win a season with a with a 38, 40 game one nils rather than a few five, six losses, so to speak. You know, it's it's a results driven business and it, it doesn't matter if you play, you know, Pep Guardiola football that's great to watch, or if you play Jose Mourinho, Antonio Conte football that's not so great to watch. It gets the results. That's the that's the most important thing. Now and it's interesting that they've brought this statement out now for me because coming into an international break. A lot of teams do decide to pull that trigger because it gives a manager time to come in when there's a little bit of disruption and there's that. It's it's just not been a good start at all for pars and there's not really a an ideal time. There's never an ideal time to say you know this is when we'll change everything in the club. But for changing a manager, there are these moments and seasons where you think this could be it. Do you think this was a an opportunity for pars to sack him and nobody would have really made a fuss about it but at the same time everybody is now up in arms the fact that they've held on to them yeah i mean look i mean fans are right to want change i mean considering the way that it was all billed i mean he was never the most glowing appointment to begin with uh when he came in in the summer from aloha uh, there were question marks over him to begin with soon because there was this new german board coming in and they were talking about getting the family back up to premier set back up to where they need to be and then they appoint someone like peter grant who didn't exactly have the best track record in um <laughs> in, in recent times anyway so that was seen as a bit of a an odd decision um and then it's just not panned out i mean Four glittering games in the group stages of a cup they were dumped out in, of in the next round has just not been able to be made up for. And I mean, you do just think even if he'd won maybe a couple of more games, it might, it might have been a bit more calm, the whole situation. But the fact that it's just gone so wrong and the board have been so defiant against the fans' cries for change, cries for just protection, I suppose, of the league status. Because, as I said, if they do carry on the way they're going, there's only one way they're going and that's down. But, uh, yep, there you go. And, uh, yeah, there's just been a bad, bad time for Dunfermline. And uh, we have brought in a new member to the State of Scottish Football team who is going to be getting involved in the next couple of weeks or so. His name's Jake Gray, and he was part of the Bonnie Rig Rose media team, and he's a Dunfermline fan. He covered a lot of Dunfermline Athletic for Energy Sport when he was at Napier with us. And we'll probably be able to hear a lot more about this situation firsthand from him. So, hopefully... Nothing massive happens at Dunfermline over the next couple of weeks because we want to get him in and we want to hear his opinions on the current situation before anything else happens. But, uh, yeah, for, from my point of view, from the view of a fellow championship jobber, I suppose you could say, <laughs> uh, I, I, I do understand the frustrations because I was frustrated with my club and I'm very glad that the new chairman has decided to make that difficult decision to get rid of David Hopkin very quickly. Uh, Jim Duffy's been appointed. Didn't get off the first, the best of starts with his, uh, with his permanent life in it, in, in the job getting spanked four and a off a party at the weekend. But he's done all right. He steadied the ship a little bit. We're looking a bit better than we were uh, previously. So there's a bit of hope, I suppose. 
but no, I completely, I can completely empathise with the Dunfermline the Athletic support, and for their sake, I hope things change soon. Definitely. I mean, I just look at two massive European examples. Uh, you know, back in 2016, when Rafa Benitez was in charge at Real Madrid, they they sacked him halfway through the season, brought in Zidane, they won the Champions League, and then we saw the same thing at Chelsea season when Lampard got sacked halfway through. And Thomas Tuchel came in and it was Champions League. You know, I'm not I'm not saying Pars could go and win the championship, but you know, I think a few fans will have that opinion that if they were to attack Jim Duffy, they could go all the way because they've got the squad and the players. But it's not they're not there at the moment. And I am looking forward to Jake's first show, to be honest, because mm. I'd love to see uh a Dunfermline fan on here and just just have the point of view heard, to be honest. Because I don't actually know that many Dunfermline fans, so it'll be uh, be nice to hear that opinion. But um we've got five minutes left. And I think we'll just finish up on, on a bit of the old firm, to be honest, because with, with Red Zone being scrapped, do you think the Rangers, uh, Celtic, pardon me, are going to give Rangers some seats at the upcoming old firm? Of course, the first one this season, Celtic weren't allowed any fans at all. Do you think they're going to return that favour to Rangers or do you think they're going to be more kind and, and give them some seats? Ooh. <laughs> it really it really does depend on what you think the level of pettiness is going to be between the two because I'd imagine there'd be a lot of a uh, lot of campaigning for no away support and I could understand why I mean Kilmarnock didn't allow their any air any away support in the opening uh, derby of the season on the opening day of the championship season so I, I would absolutely not like to have Kilmarnock at Somerset Park but equally I would because I think it would be an even better atmosphere for when they get absolutely scudded. Um, <laughs> I think <laughs> going, when, going, not going with when, when I've got that level of confidence with Jim Duffy now, even though we just get scalped 4 0. Uh, I think they should realistically offer some away allocation because look, away, away fans contribute to any atmosphere. I mean, realistically, it's always better having some away yeah. fans. And a ground. If you're a home fan, you can throw some abuse at them. If you're an away fan, you get to travel and see your team all over the country, which is absolutely brilliant. And I think it's something in Scotland that is a lot more possible than it is in other in other countries. I mean, you'd imagine going Southampton to Newcastle away, like in England, like that's just an absolute nightmare. But say it's air going up to Inverness, I'd probably be the same. The same, and even that's less of a journey. So it's more possible to get to these away ties if you're an away fan, and I think in any opportunity, it's not it's not even like they're travelling a lot for, for an old firm. I mean, I'm kind of going a bit hyperbolic with it. But yeah, I, I would I would certainly like to see an away support of the next old firm because I feel like it could be very, very fun from a neutral's perspective. Definitely. I, th- I think as well, I think, you know, you often talk about the 12th man and, and I think that can make a massive difference because I've seen a lot of Hibs fans talking about the result of the weekend and whenever people are making the point that it would have been a good result a lot of people are mentioning there wasn't a Hibs fan in Ibrox and I think that is quite a big contributing factor to these results just to point out that we might have won at the weekend we might have lost at the weekend we didn't have any fans in the stadium and it must be it must be harsh for players because even though away fans don't have that big of a section they don't have as many as the home fans quite often you can hear them you know when a game gets going especially in an old firm both sides can can have their voices heard for sure and I think that's absolutely massive, to be honest. I feel we need that in Scottish football. From a neutral point of view, if you see the opposite team score, you want to hear them. You know, there's been a few times this season where somebody has scored and there's been no reaction at all from the crowd that you're thinking, has that even gone in the back of the net? You know, have they even scored? Because it's it's just silent. You know, I remember in the um, mm. Celtic uh, Leverkusen game when Leverkusen scored, it, it was just silence. And I, and I felt, you know, this is just weird. Is it, has it been flagged offside or something like that? Has there been yeah. some kind of disallowed goal? It just it just doesn't make for a good atmosphere from a neutral point of view. Do you do you feel that as well watching these games at home that if there's only one, one set of fans that we've seen, it's, it just doesn't have the same feel to it? It's not, not an old firm, so to speak. Absolutely. No, it do- doesn't have to be an old firm. It doesn't even have to be a massive rivalry game. It can be any game whatsoever that you're what it could be what, Motherwell versus Ross County, if there's no away fans, and it's just not going to be the same if Ross County going down to Far Park managed to get a goal. It's just not going to be the same if you don't hear the roar of that travelling away support because the, these guys that are going to travel there, kind of more, I don't really want to put a folk in a box, like, but they've got a real passion for their club and the fact that they're willing to follow them to whatever in the country says a lot about them. So they're absolutely going to create an atmosphere. They're going to create some noise and uh, it's massive for them to be able to have have these opportunities to go and follow our teams and I think it does build for a better atmosphere not only for 
the game itself, but for Scottish football and football in general, because you just want to see these scenes. I mean, away away scenes are some of the best scenes that you can get. So having that opportunity, you want to take it with both hands as many times as you possibly can. Definitely. As you say, one of the best things about being a football fan is being an away fan, getting to travel the grounds and just see your team pull up the results but um i'm afraid that's all we've got time for here tonight jack i'd like to thank you for joining me i've really enjoyed our plethora of topics that we've gone through here tonight especially the uh, the old charlie mulgrew one i can't believe i'm actually thinking in the back of my <laughs> mind now that he might make it into the team or there perhaps is a an avenue for him to creep into the squad but um yeah we'll be back time again tomorrow night time will tell I, I hope time tells john sutter to be honest i'd much rather be <laughs> half past john sutter than any other time but it's neither here nor there. Oh, could, could be quarter to Mulgrew. I'm going to stop now before I get carried away with these terrible jokes. Uh, we'll, we'll see you same time, same place tomorrow night. Cheers. <laughs>